Good evening and welcome back to our Wednesday evening Bible study and prayer meeting. We hope that you had a wonderful Christmas with your family, a safe one, and hopefully you are well and hopefully you had a great New Year's as well. And we're glad to be back and starting a new year, 2021, as we continue our study through the book of First Peter. And tonight we're up to First Peter chapter 3. So as we begin tonight, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we just want to thank you for this opportunity that we can come and study your word. And Father, it is your word that gives us wisdom, that guides us and directs us in every aspect of our lives. And Father, we thank you, uh, Lord God, for the truth of your word. And Lord, I ask that you would just give us teachable hearts and hearts that are submissive to you and to your will and your leading in our lives. And so, Father, that you would receive all the honor and glory, that our lives would be a godly witness and a testimony of your grace to an onlooking world. And so, Father, we thank you for your amazing love. We thank you for the so great salvation that we have through your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for your presence with us every moment of every day and your Holy Spirit who is in us and working through us, conforming us to the image of your Son. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, our last few weeks, uh, we were in the book of 1 Peter. We were talking about uh, the testimony of the believer and the culture in which they live. And Peter focused upon this key area of submission. And we looked at, a few weeks back, we looked at, uh, as Paul addresses this issue of submission to civil authorities... And what is God's will for us as believers in that regards? Then he went into uh, the believer's submission within the workplace. And what God's will is in regards to that as well. And as he did that, Peter focuses upon the supreme example of, of, of this submissiveness in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he did that in verses... You'll, uh, um, in, verse, in verse 21, he says, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving it as an example, that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, he did not revile in return when he suffered. He did not threaten, but he committed himself to him who judges righteously. He committed himself to the will of the Father there. Um, who bore, himself, uh, bore our sins in his own body on the cross. So we see the perfect example was the Lord Jesus Christ of submission to the will of the Father. And so now we look at this third area of submission that Peter addresses, and this has to do with the area within marriage, within the family, God's uh, design within the family and how submission plays a very important part to that, especially when it comes to our witness within our families and within our communities and an onlooking um, world. And so, as we begin tonight, let's read here in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, and we're going to go through tonight through verse 7. So, let me read these verses together uh, with you. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct, accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, uh, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. So as we begin in this section, Peter has some instructions for the wife as he addresses that. He's going to deal with the husband as well, but first Peter addresses the wife and 
most likely in this context, it seems to be, as we read this, it says, likewise, uh, wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. Well, this likewise is referring us back to the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself was a perfect example of submission. And, and this is important because we talked about, even the uh, past weeks, how s- the word submission means to subject to, to rank under. And this, in the present middle form, emphasizes this reflection of a reflect reflexive action of submitting oneself, submitting yourself willingly, voluntarily. And so he, he addresses the wives saying, like, wives likewise be submissive to your own husbands that even if some do not obey the word. And the idea there is these husbands that were most likely not believers. These were wives who had become Christians After they were already married, they had become Christians, but their husbands still were not Christians at this point in time. And so he gives instructions to them to be still submissive to your husbands. So what is Peter talking about here in being submissive to our husbands? Well, first of all, we need to understand that God has ordained certain obligations for mankind's well-being. He has established an authority uh, structure that is for our good, for our well-being. And so we see here God's blueprint for the wife. What is God's design for the wife? And this is when the scriptures talk about submission. It is not talking about in any way is she inferior to her husband. Just as a worker in the workplace is in no way inferior to the boss. They're both human beings who are co-equal, but they have different positions within the company. And same thing within civil authorities. We're all humans of the same race, but hold different positions of authority. And so the same way when it comes to the family, the woman is in no way intellectually or in any other way inferior to her husband, but we see that God has designed the family to be one that in every, just like in everything else within God's creation, there is an order, there is a design. And for it to function the way God intended, it's important that we willingly apply these principles into our lives. And so his instructions to the wife here, who is married to uh, an individual who is not a Christian at the time, is still to be, to willingly submit herself to his headship, to his authority. Now does that mean as well that she should uh, submit to uh, any type of treatment that he may treat her if he's abusive to her, physically abusing her? Does she need to just willingly stay in that and allow him to just get No, no, that's not what he's talking about here in this situation. No, and nor in a situation where a husband would be seeking to pressure his wife to do something that would be totally against God's word that is wicked and ungodly. No, she is first and foremost to submit herself to God. And that is key when we talk about this area of submission because it totally goes against our flesh. Our flesh, we oftentimes, we want to be in control. We want to be in charge. And so many times in marriages, we see marriages that are torn apart because a husband and a wife are fighting and battling for control in that marriage. And it just leads to destruction and and it leads to all kinds of heartache and pain and hurt within the marriage. But see, we see here that God's design is what is best for us. And, and hear his instructions to the wife is to submit to the headship of her husband. And she is to do this out of, first of all, submitting to the Lord being willing to do, to, to do her marriage the way God has commanded her to do her marriage in humble submission to God's plans and to her husband because she respects him, because she chooses to love him and treat him with honor. And it doesn't always mean because the husband is worthy of honor or uh, because the, the husband is a man of high integrity or character, but but she chooses on her part to be faithful to the responsibility that God has given her to lovingly 
respect, to treat her husband with honor and respect, to support the, the, the headship that God has placed upon the man in that marriage relationship. And so he says, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. I love this. You notice here that Christian wives who lovingly submit to the authority, to the, the headship of her husband is the greatest evangelistic tool that she has in reaching her husband who is not a Christian. And the, notice he says here that they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. And sometimes... I think in a marriage relationship, a wife so badly wants her husband to come to know Jesus Christ that she constantly is preaching at him. She's constantly nagging him, trying to get him to come to church. And in all, by doing that constantly, she's really pushing him away. And really, hear what Peter is saying is that her life, her conduct is the greatest witness to her husband, as her husband sees that transformation of her life. He remembers what she used to be like. And now that she has become a Christian, to see the, this humility, this servanthood, this respect and loving care for her husband is a great witness and a testimony that God uses in bringing that husband to Christ. Not the demanding her rights. No, this is not right. This is not fair. You can't talk to me like this. This is, you, you, you I'm not going to put up with this. No, but she willingly and lovingly focuses on honoring God and treating her husband the way God has commanded her to treat her husband. And not preaching, but uh, yes, they do need to hear the gospel. They need to hear the message of the gospel. But we can't jam it down people's throat. Can't jam it down your husband's throat. We need to um, allow the witness and the testimony of our lives. After we've preached the gospel, let our lives be a witness and a testimony to what the power of God and what the gospel has done and what it can do in their lives as well. So, what a great witness. What a great testimony. Notice... He goes on, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. I love that. When they observe, they see, they on, on display, a visual display of a godly lifestyle. This is the idea of preaching a wordless sermon with your life. These are not just words, but it is a life that is lived out in everyday circumstances and situations that has done so with a servant's heart and humility and respectfulness towards her husband. And he sees this, he observes this. He's, he's not seeing a woman that's trying to manipulate him to get what she wants. No, he's seeing a woman who genuinely loves and cares for him without any strings attached. No, he, he looks and he sees not a woman that is lazy, that sits around, that doesn't take care of, seeks to take care of the home or seeks to take care of herself or seeks to take care of her husband or family. No, no. He sees someone who is diligent, who is hardworking, who is not self-serving, but who cares for the needs of others. He observes this. He sees it in her attitudes, in her actions, in the words that come out of her mouth. He's not hearing her gossip and talk bad about all the other uh, women or about other people. No, no, she speaks words of kindness and encouragement. He doesn't hear her lying about uh, certain things or individuals uh, or uh, things that she said she was going to do. And, but no, he sees a woman of truthfulness, of, of character. And again, he's, he sees not a woman who is arguing and fighting and constantly trying to go back and forth when he maybe does something that she doesn't like, she attacks back or tries to, to get even. No, no, no. The idea is that this, the, this unsaved husband observes her pure, her chaste conduct, this godliness that is accompanied by fear or respect. 
And I love that. She is showing this respect to her husband and to the authority that God has placed in, uh, uh, um, in his hands. And so she lives her life as unto the Lord. She focuses on loving her husband and showing him the respect that God calls her to, to show not expecting anything in return, but out of loving obedience to the Lord and out of love for her husband. And listen, we can't do that. Ladies, you can't do that on your own. That's not natural. It's not normal. Our flesh, our, our sinful hearts, we, we naturally want to uh, argue back. We naturally want to prove our point. Or we naturally want our own way. And so we need God's grace to humble us. We need God's grace to help us to love and to submit the way God has called us to. And by the way, we're going to go a little bit further. God doesn't just call the wife to submit. He calls even the husband to submit as well. So we're going to see that here in just a little bit. But I just want to make that clear as well. But you'll notice our conduct that our lives should be a godly witness. Husbands, wives, it doesn't matter who it is. Some of our greatest witness is the testimony of our lives. Not just, yes, we need to verbalize the gospel, we need to share the gospel, but we need to make sure that our lives, they won't be perfect, they won't, uh, perfect. They won't be perfect, but they need to be a consistent pattern that, that people can observe a Christ-likeness, a Christ-like character in our lives. And notice as he goes on here in verse 3, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the, the hair and the wearing gold or putting on fine apparel. And this was a very normal during the Greco-Roman Empire. There, The women would be very absorbed in their outward appearance, the external, and making sure that they looked super uh, nice and doing, and, and a lot of their appearance was focused on gaining the interest of their husband. And they thought that the best way to do that was just the external, the outward appearance. And we're going to see Peter says, no, that is not the main way now. You'll notice he says, do not let your adornment be merely outward. He's not saying that you shouldn't take care of your outward appearance. Because we should. Our bodies are from the Lord. God has given us these bodies. We should take care of them. We should want to look nice for our spouses. We should do everything we can to make our, uh, groom ourselves, to make sure we look nice and presentable. Now, but we should not be absorbed with that. We were constantly, our focus is constantly on the external. Because notice what he says here. Rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and acquired spirit which is very precious in the sight of God. I love this. He's saying take time to groom your heart. Yes, take care of your outward. Take care of the outside. Right? God has given us his body. Be good stewards of it. But also groom and take time to work on your heart. And so oftentimes, I wonder if we were to take an evaluation of the time that we spend in front of the mirror, in the shower, and, and, and doing our, uh, uh, taking care of our fingernails, or our pedicures, and manicures, and all these other things. I wonder how much time we put into that, how much thought and focus we put into it, and then... I wonder how much time do we focus on becoming more like Jesus Christ? How much time do we focus on getting into God's Word, spending time with God, allowing God's Word to transform our thinking and to transform our lives? He says that's the much more important, the inner beauty of the heart. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart. Not the external, but the internal, he says. That is the key. That is what will win our, uh, an unsaved husband or unsaved wife to Christ will be the conduct, the, the character of the individual. And that's what we need to focus on as believers in Christ, that Christ-like character, the inner person of the heart. And trust me, that will come out in the words that we speak. It will come out in our actions. It will come out in, in just the, the way that we treat other people. So it's very, very important that, that we focus on the internal aspects of our character. And only God can change that. And God does that through the power of his word, through the spirit of God. 
as we're allowing and filling our, our hearts and minds with the truth of the word of God and allowing it uh, to, to guide and direct every aspect of our lives. And so that's what will truly get the attention of, of our spouses, of our, in this context, of, of, of her unsaved husband. And I love what he says here. The incorruptible beauty of a gentle and the quiet spirit. He says here, this incru- our, our, our physical beauty will fade. As we get older, it will fade. But the, the inner beauty of the heart does not fade. <laughs> Listen, that's ongoing all the way till we breathe our last breath, till we go to be with the Lord. Our character is much longer lasting than the temporary beauty of the external. So he says, a gentle and a quiet spirit. Not an argumentative and a fighting and abrasive spirit, but I love a gentle heart, a, a gentleness, a, a quiet spirit that, is, that seeks to uh, respond in Christ likeness. Remember, Jesus didn't retaliate, he didn't get even, he didn't revile. Each time they reviled him, he didn't revile back. No, but he committed himself to the Father. And so, wives, the same must be true. Committing yourself to the Father as you humbly submit and encourage and support the, the leadership of your husband and the family relationship there. And so notice I love at the end of that, he says, which is very precious on the side of God. Sometimes we get so wrapped up with trying to worry about what other people think about us, what our husbands think about us, what our wives think about us, and what we need to be most concerned about is what does God think about us? And we see this is what is very precious on the side of God, the inner beauty of the heart, a man, a woman of character, of godliness, who loves the Lord, who is submissive to God, and who is submissive to, to God's plan and God's authority a structure uh, for the family. Let me keep moving on here. In verse 5, he says, For in this manner in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves. And so now he's going to give them an example and a model to follow here from the scriptures. And he says, Being submissive to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any tear. So notice here he gives the example of Sarah and Sarah wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination but Sarah we see a consistent pattern in her life of her love for Abraham her submission to his uh, his headship in her life and we see um, throughout that old the Old Testament just uh, the testimony of her life no she didn't argue and fight with Abraham and resist his, his, uh, his leadership, but no, she lovingly supported and encouraged and, uh, and prayed, I'm sure, for Abraham uh, many, many times. So Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And notice he says, whose daughters you are, for all those who are true born-again believers. For every woman uh, that is, uh, every wife that uh, is truly born again, said we are <laughs> to follow the same example of Sarah, who was a believer as well, and that uh, we are part of that seed through Abraham. And so uh, Peter says here, whose daughters you are, follow her example, as we most importantly follow the example of Jesus Christ. And notice he says, uh, you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. I, I love what he says here, if you do good. And I think this is very important that we focus on continuing to do what is right in our lives. And you notice it said there that these women who trusted in God adorned themselves. Yes, they, uh, these women who trusted God adorned themselves on the inside, on the beauty of the heart. They were women of character such as Sarah, such as Ruth from the Old Testament as well. These were godly examples, women who trusted in God, who trusted God's plan for their life. In, even within their marriage relationship. And they submitted to their husbands. And so we see there, they trusted God. His plan is order. The, the, um, we see the beauty treatments of submission in their lives. We saw the example of Sarah and Ruth. But they continued to do good, to do what is right. Even if the other, if the other spouse in the marriage isn't doing the right thing, that doesn't give us the right then to do what is wrong either. 
No, God wants us to continue to do what is right, obey God, and by our lives, be a godly witness and a testimony to them. And are not afraid with any terror. There's no, and though the women, maybe that scares uh, some women, this idea of submission, but when we commit ourselves to the will of God, God who protects us, a God, um, again, is reminded, this does not mean that the woman should stay in some kind of abusive relationship or uh, should submit to her husband if he's wanting her to do something that is wicked or ungodly, but in just the normal, general sense of the idea of submission, as she does it, she doesn't need to fear um, any types of uh, uh, serious, dangerous situations that could arise out of that. But no, they entrust themselves to God and as they continue to do what is right, su submitting and lovingly um, uh, supporting their husbands, that's exactly what God has called them to, to be that helpmate. But notice the instructions to the husbands here in verse 7. Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding. And so now he focuses on the husband's role to care for his wife. And what we see here as well is the husband likewise here we see that we're likewise. He is to follow the example of Christ and submitting as well. And this submission has to do with his duty to lovingly care for the needs and the feelings of his wife. And so the husband as well is called to submit, to willingly submit himself voluntarily out of love and uh, to care for his wife, to dwell, he says, with them, with understanding to dwell together. And this idea is to show consideration, to be considerate um, of her and sensitive to, to, uh, to her physical, spiritual, and emotional needs. He is to physically take care of and to protect as she dwells with her. They are one flesh. And so they are, he is to nourish and to cherish her. Oh, he is to spend time listening to her. And so oftentimes, men, and I know I've oftentimes been guilty so many times myself, the importance of intentionally taking the time to listen to our spouses and husbands to listen to your wives. I know there's so many things on our mind from work and other things that are going on, but we need to make sure that we are intentional about removing any distractions and make sure that we, as we come home, that we are listening to our wives as they're sharing some of the struggles maybe that they're going through, some of the, 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 the just the battles that they're dealing with, uh, some emotional things that they may be struggling with. We need to listen, and we need to listen well. And that's hard sometimes. And again, because of our sinful hearts, we need God's help to truly dwell with understanding with our wives. Truly caring and listening and being sensitive to their needs. But in order to do that too, we need to be home. We need, sometimes we get so caught up with business, work, and our work, and then going out with friends, this, that, and the other, that we spend very little time at home and actually communicating with our spouses. And no wonder marriages are so weak and so why there are so many divorces. No, listen. We need to dwell together with understanding with our wives. We need to cherish them, to love them. He says here, giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel. And it doesn't mean that she's weaker in an in, in intellectual way or inferior in any way. It's some of physical stature. In a normal sense, the, the woman is, um, uh, is not built in the same stature as a man. And so it is the man who is to treat her with honor, who is to take care of her, to provide for her. And so that's the idea here, as uh, you'll notice, to treat her special, to treat her as the treasure that she truly is, to show her honor. And so oftentimes we neglect to show that honor to our father. We neglect to show how special that our wives truly are. And we need to confess that to the Lord. And we need to confess that to our wives. And we need to work on that with God's help to make sure that we are taking the time to truly communicate to our wives that honor and how much we appreciate them 
and all that they do, it does not go unnoticed, but to give them the honor that they rightly deserve. Treat her as special. Hold that door for her. Take time to just go out on those special dates. To take time with just you and your, you and your wife. And where you can focus on her and show her how precious she is to you. But, and it says, as being heirs together, the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Notice, as heirs together of the grace of life. This reminds us of the importance, this heirs together, of this most important relationship. And it is the most, that God has given, and it is the marriage relationship. He says, outside of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, obviously our relationship with God, but this marriage relationship, he says, that we are to cultivate this companionship. We are to, to uh, um, focus on developing this true and intimate friendship with our wives. We are heirs together. We are together in this bond as husband and wife. And may, we, may it grow stronger and deeper as we both seek the Lord and as we both submit to the Lord and to one another in this marriage relationship. And notice that your prayers may not be hindered. One of the greatest hindrances to uh, the prayer life between a husband and wife is living in disobedience to God's commands, even in this area of submission, both for husbands and wives. How can we expect God to hear our prayers when we're unwilling to follow the biblical principles that he has laid forth in his word for each of us as husbands and as wives? No, listen. As we humbly submit to God, then God hears our prayers. And as we're doing that, God is blessing that marriage and strengthening that marriage relationship. But we cannot expect God to honor those prayers if we are willfully living in disobedience to him. So I just want to encourage us tonight. This marriage relationship is not easy. It, will, it does not, these things that Peter is talking about do not come natural. <laughs> our sinful hearts naturally want our own way and we want to be served rather than learning to serve. And so we need to call out to God in, in, in absolute surrender and brokenness, asking God to change us, surrendering ourselves, submitting to him so that we may truly submit to our, our wives and, and wives submit to their husbands the way God has called us to in total unselfishness and surrender and complete commitment and love to one another and to the Lord Jesus Christ. So the testimony of the marriage relationship involving mutual submission according to God's design is a powerful witness to the wisdom of God and the gospel. And so, and not just in a marriage uh, relationship between two believers, but as well as the testimony of a believer's conduct in a marriage to an unbeliever. God didn't, doesn't say just because somebody's an unbeliever that you should just divorce them. No, no, no. God says you're, you, you're in that relationship he wants you to focus on loving the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to him and following and submitting to the biblical principles that God has called you to in that marriage. And as you do that, God will use you in your life to impact and, and reach your husband with the gospel of Christ. And it, obviously he has to choose to respond on his own, but the greatest witness will be the witness of your life, the conduct. So guard your heart. And when you're guilty, because we will be at times, as husbands and wives, we get in disputes and arguments. And even in those times, one, sometimes the greatest witness as well is to learn to humbly come and seek forgiveness. To be able to admit, I'm sorry, I'm wrong in what I said or what I did. Would you please forgive me? What a great witness and a testimony in and of itself. And so, as we wrap up tonight, I just want to encourage us in our marriage relationships, that we humbly submit ourselves to the Lord first and then to each of the roles and responsibility that God has called us to as husbands and wives. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for, God, uh, the amazing grace that you have poured out upon us through your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, I know so oftentimes, Lord, 
Your ways are not our ways. God, your ways are good and right. So oftentimes, Father, we want to do life our own way. We want to do marriage our own way. And what a mess we make of things. But God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the gospel, for the Lord Jesus Christ that rescues us from the penalty of sin and rescues us from ourselves. And God, we ask tonight, Father, that you would take these principles that we've looked at tonight, humble us, Father, and help us to submit ourselves to your, uh, your blueprint for marriage. And God, no matter what, how others respond to us, help us to unconditionally love our spouses. Father, help us to um, sacrificially love our spouses. And Father, to continue to do what is right and good, serving and caring for the needs of each other. Father, we love you, and may you be honored and glorified. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, if you're with us, uh, maybe for the first time, or maybe you've watched us before, and uh, I want to, first of all, just encourage you in this most important area that concerning a relationship with the one true living God. The Bible says that God loves us. He created us to be in a relationship with him. But the Bible makes it very clear that man has chosen to rebel against his creator. We have chosen to go our own way. And because of that, the Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us have rebelled against God. And because he, he loves us, but because he's just and holy, he has to punish sin. And therefore, the wages of sin is death and separation from God. And so God, who loves us, who doesn't want us to be separated from him, but he's just and he must punish sin. Um, uh, because of that, in his infinite love and mercy, provided a payment for your sin. And God willingly gave the, the Lord Jesus Christ. As God the Son humbled himself, left the, glory, the glories of heaven, took on human flesh, and lived the perfect life. And as fully God and fully man, he died in our place on the cross and took the punishment for your sin and for my sin so you could have the opportunity to be forgiven and reconciled to him. Now, many people think that by, just by being religious or just by turning over a new leaf in their life that, and just trying to do the right thing and just trying to treat people the right way, that that'll be good enough to get them to heaven. And, but the problem is they're mistaken. They're relying upon their own ideas and thoughts and what others have said, not what the God's Word says. God's Word makes it very clear that we are guilty before God and we need the righteousness of God. And it's not our righteousness. It's the righteousness that God has provided through faith in Christ and Christ alone. And we receive that when we come to God with a broken, repentant heart, acknowledging our sin against God and acknowledging there our inability to do anything to save ourselves but put our complete trust in Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection as our means uh, of salvation and trust in him alone as Lord and Savior. And so if you have never done that today, we want to encourage you right where you're at. Just simply bow your head and, and, and brokenness. Cry out to God. Acknowledge your sin. Acknowledge your inability to save yourself and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and him alone as Lord and Savior. And the, the Bible says the minute you do that, you are born again. In other words, you are spiritually dead enemy of God at one point, but the minute you repent and receive Christ, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to you or charged to you and God has forgiven you and made you part of his family. And uh, what a great truth. And, and if that's true about you tonight, I just want to encourage you. Please call us here at the church where we'd love uh, for you to just get in contact with you and encourage you in this new relationship and to help you to continue to grow. So Lord bless you. At this time, though, I do want to take uh, just a few moments just to look at a few of the uh, prayer requests. Uh, to encourage you throughout this week to, uh, as you uh, remember these uh, requests, to lift them up to the Lord. And first of all, I want to just continue to pray for our missionaries around the world who are seeking to faithfully proclaim the good news of the gospel. And some of them are, are facing some very treacherous situations and persecution. So please, please pray for them and, and their families that they would, that God would just put his hedge of protection around them and but that the gospel would continue to go forth, that God would use these missionaries all over the world for his kingdom's sake. Pray also for our nation. We need godly leaders both in the church as well as uh, just in the leadership of our nation. And we are definitely at a, at a very important time in the history of our country. So we need to be in great prayer for the leadership both in our churches and our country, that God would raise up godly leaders. 
Also, I'd like to encourage, um, please uh, uh, just continue to pray for any unsaved loved ones that you have and your family, our coworkers. Continue to pray for them. Pray that, that God would open their hearts to the gospel. Pray that God would use you to share the gospel with them. And so pray for those unsaved loved ones and look for opportunities. Maybe to share a track, give a phone call, an email, a text, or go pay them a visit. Whatever it may be, just ask God to use you to share the good news of the gospel with them. Also pray for, again, as I mentioned, just our leaders in the federal, state, and local government, all those different levels, for judges, uh, for legislators, and all these things. We really need to be praying that, that they would... That, that, we want to pray for their salvation first and foremost, but also pray that there would be godly men in those positions that would lead our country. Also, please pray for Billy Hartswell and their family. Billy just passed away um, today. The, the day that we're taping this is Monday. She had just passed away today. So please keep her family uh, in, uh, in your prayers, and I'm sure they would greatly appreciate that. Please pray for our military personnel. Uh, Tabo Adams right now, he's in boot camp, so please pray for him, and I know the, the mom and dad as well, and I'm sure the brother and sister as they miss, uh, miss Tabo, and I know not being able to be in contact with them, so please pray for their family and pray for Tabo as well. I'm sure it's tough on him being away from them. So pray the family of the week is Rich and Sharon Fusco, and uh, actually my parents, so uh, please keep them in your prayers. Uh, dad had COVID, but he's doing much better. Doing well, and my mom had a little surgery. Where they did a little biopsy, but she's uh, doing very well as well. Came back benign. So just a praise for the praise for those uh, answers uh, to God's prayers there. But please just lift them up in your prayers, just that they would continue to seek the Lord. And um, and uh, so we appreciate that much. Also, uh, some more praises, and that is, I know for um, we had three families that visited this week, and so just pray that as we. Uh, Follow up with those individuals too, that whatever God's will may be, that uh, again, that we would just minister to them um, uh, in whatever uh, means that we can. So, well, thank you again for spending your Wednesday evening with us. May the Lord bless you and uh, may you have a good and godly week and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. God bless.